It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My first question this morning is uh, for the Premier. Uh, we know that the Long-Term Care Commission obtained uh, notes from the Minister of Long-Term Care uh, regarding what was happening uh, in long-term care with COVID-19. Uh, on April the 17th, uh, 19, or 2020, just last year when we were in the first wave, this is what uh, the minister had jotted down in her notebook, and I quote, military plan needed. Get them within 24 to 48 hours. Homes spiral down quickly. The Premier didn't ask for the, uh, the Canadian Armed Forces to help Ontario until five days after that note was jotted down, and they didn't arrive until 12 days later. In fact, they didn't arrive to Downsview until early June. So the question, question is, why did the Premier wait five days after this note was written by the Minister to actually call the CAF to get some help to those homes? To reply, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, and the uh, leader of the opposition is, is correct in, in how important the uh, the armed forces was uh, to helping us uh, uh, stabilize uh, some of the uh, the homes. Uh, uh, through the first wave, Mr. Speaker, as you know, there was a whole-of-government effort, uh, especially during the, the, the first wave, to uh, improve capacity in, uh, uh, in our acute care system, uh, as well as, uh, as assist uh, in the long-term care system, uh, Mr. Speaker. As I mentioned yesterday, look, we were on the defense for a better part of, uh, of a year when it came to fighting uh, the, first, uh, the first wave of COVID, ostensibly because of the situation that we had been left in by the previous uh, government. We are making significant progress uh, in ensuring that uh, our long-term care system system is, uh, is better equipped not only to handle future pandemics, uh, God forbid that that should happen again, but to provide the best quality of care for the people of the province of Ontario who have been so important to help them build this province. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the military debriefing notes tell quite the horrifying story of what they found in long-term care when they did arrive. Two homes, Downsview and Hawthorne, were infested with cockroaches. They also found 26 seniors who died when all they needed was water. The Minister of Long-Term Care knew that the Canadian Armed Forces were needed uh, on April 17th, and yet they didn't arrive for over 12 days. The Premier didn't even ask for them until five days after she was aware that they were necessary. So did the Minister of Long-Term Care not bring this, uh, this necessary uh, request to the Premier's attention, or did the Premier simply not act on it quickly enough? To reply, the government has uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I, look, as I've said, and I'll say it again, and I'll, I'll say it throughout uh, question period, I suspect, uh, the Armed Forces was in a very important part uh, in helping us uh, stabilize a number of long-term care homes uh, in the province of Ontario through the first wave. Uh, we saw uh, across uh, across Canada that, uh, in fact, our long-term care homes uh, in many provinces needed the assistance of the armed forces, in particular in both uh, uh, Ontario and uh, and in Quebec, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, we were moving very, very quickly uh, throughout the first wave, uh, as I said, uh, and, and uh, uh, I'll repeat again, Mr. Speaker, uh, we were left on uh, on a defensive posture for much of the the first wave as we attempted to catch up to the lack of investment that we had uh, inherited, Mr. Speaker, whether it was infection, infection prevention and control measures, whether it was uh, uh, renovating old homes that uh, that needed to be fixed. Quite frankly, the addition Fonts? of uh, greater capacity in the system, dealing with the uh, the health and human resources, Mr. Speaker. There is a lot of work that needed to be done uh, that we inherited. We're getting it done, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I thank you. And the final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. You know, the military are people who are trained for combat, and they are actually trained to expect the worst. The military staff in the notes that, uh, that uh, we saw uh, indicate that they were horrified at the very idea of having to return to any of these homes. In fact, the very thought of it, in one person's words, is that it sucked the life right out of you, the idea of having to return. One medic said that they saw more death in one week in their, their long-term care uh, stint than they had in all of their other tours of duty combined. On April 17th, the Minister of Long-Term Care indicated that she needed to get the CAF, the Canadian Armed Forces, into long-term care immediately. But 
there was a delay. So the question is, who's responsible for the delay? Is it the Premier that delayed, or was it the Minister of Long-Term Care that didn't identify to the Premier quickly enough to get the CIA? Uh, thanks again, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, look, the, the, the Canadian Armed Forces played a, a, a vital role, uh, especially in the first wave, in, in helping us address some of the shortcomings that, uh, that became evident in long-term care homes when the uh, uh, advice or, or the request was made. Uh, we're very appreciative of the Armed Forces coming in. Uh, they did it as quickly as they possibly could in both uh, Ontario and in Quebec, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but it, the whole system highlights, and the Commission report highlights, uh, the, the problems that we inherited in the system, uh, with uh, whether it was underfunding, Mr. Speaker, whether it was homes that were old and in desperate need of renovations, whether it was the health and human resources, these PSWs who have been working so hard for so long but were underfunded, Mr. Speaker. So we moved quickly before the pandemic, during the pandemic and since the pandemic to address the things that we knew, some of the problems that we knew were happening in long-term care, Mr. Speaker, whether it's four hours of, uh, of care, Response. hiring 27,000 additional PSWs, Mr. Speaker. The Armed Forces was an important part of the first wave, Mr. Speaker, and we're appreciating all of the work that they did for us. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Uh, this one's going to be about, um, about vaccinations, and particularly the second doses. People are very anxious to know when it is that they're going to be able to get their second shot. Uh, and they want, to, they want to know so that they don't have to scramble at the last minute uh, like they've had to do for the first shot. A full four months is what was expected, uh, but now apparently that may change because vaccines are coming more quickly. So my question is, what is actually the government's plan? to get the second shot into people's arms. Mr. Hill. Well, we are in phase two of our rollout of the vaccines, and we are now receiving sufficient quantities, particularly of the Pfizer vaccine, that we will be able to provide people with their second shots in at the appropriate time. Uh, we have booked, actually yesterday, we did 112,000 vaccines, and we're at a total of 6,350,000 right now. So we are on track to deliver vaccines to 65% of adults over age 18. Uh, by the end of May, and of course we can now provide vaccines, the Pfizer vaccines, to young people aged 12 to uh, 16 as well. So that is rolling out. People will be able to receive their vaccines at, at the appropriate time. And because we have a, a additional supplies, if we are able to reach that target and people are coming forward, we may be able to uh, shorten the time Response. frame, but people already have their appointments for their four-month shots, and so they will receive them, maybe sooner than that, but they definitely will receive them within that time frame. And the supplementary question. People don't know when they're getting their second shot. Those shots are not booked. I haven't got a booking for my second shot. Stop the clock. Please, let's be Stop the clock. Remember, t please take your seat. The, the um, government side will come to order. The government side will come to order. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will come to order. An <laughs> the member for Niagara Falls will come to order. I'm going to ask the Leader of the Opposition to withdraw. Oh, withdraw, Speaker. And finish your question. Speaker, the government's rollout of the vaccinations has been a mess. It has been chaotic. In fact, it was safe. Stop the clock. Solicitor General will come to order. We're not going to have this. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. Please start the clock. It has been saved by the public health units. Thank goodness for them. They have to fix the rollout problem, Speaker. Instead, they're busy with a blame game, now always pointing at somebody else. Look, the sign-up system was convoluted. It excluded family doctors. Uh, the rollout that meant that people who needed the vaccines the most got them at the end instead of at the beginning. So the question is, what is the plan to fix this chaotic system for the second dose? Can the government show us one? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Okay. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry is warned. We know what that means. If I have to speak to you again, you'll be named. Please start the clock. To reply, Minister of Health. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. And contrary to what the Leader of the Official Opposition says, Speaker, we have a very organized rollout. Our vaccination campaign is rolling out well by virtue of the fact that 6.3 million doses have already been administered. That's almost half of the population of Ontario. Wow. And we are on track to book and vaccinate over 65 per cent of the adults over age uh, 18 by the end of May. I don't know anyone who would call that a failure. It's moving forward. We have our booking system where people can book online or they can call to book an appointment. They can receive their vaccines through a mass vaccination clinic, through pop-up clinics, through pharmacies. More and more pharmacies are being added every day through primary care offices. Uh, it, we're making it as easy as possible for people to be vaccinated, and we already have another four million people booked to receive the vaccine. Wow. So I would call that a coordinated system. Response? The final supplementary. Speaker, public health units and communities have come together to try to fill the holes in this government's vaccine rollout. In fact, people are calling it a scavenger hunt to try to get a vaccine. They're relying on things like vaccine hunters, Vaccine Hunters Canada, to get a vaccine here in Ontario. It has been a mess. The question I have for the government, with the government which is very, very focused on partisan ad campaigns, but not so focused on cleaning up uh, the vaccine rollout, there is a, 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 an increased supply, and I think we're all pleased about that. But the question still remains, who is going to get their shots? When are they going to get their shots? How are they going to get their shots for the second uh, vaccine? That's what people need to know, and that's what this government should be able to uh, provide in terms of information. So no more excuses. The vaccines are here. What's the plan to get the second shot Question. into people's arms? And again, the Minister of Health to reply. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the facts speak for themselves. Over 6 million doses already administered, 4 million doses already um, organized and booked. We are rolling this vaccine plan out. We're making it very easy for people. We're offering more and more pharmacies to be able to offer vaccines. In some of these pharmacies, they're open 24-7 or you can walk in. We have the mass vaccination clinics. We have clinics that are going to people's workplaces. We have a plan. The plan is being delivered and the plan is working, Speaker. The next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. Two weeks ago, all of Canada was talking about Brampton's COVID-19 crisis. We had one of the highest positivity rates in the entire country. Countless people were getting sick and many were dying. Tragic stories from Brampton were being heard across our nation, from the utterly devastating accounts of loss of life to essential workers who had to choose between going to work sick and paying the bills. But despite all this national attention, two weeks later, the Conservative government continues to fail Brampton. We still have one of the highest positivity rates in the entire country, and essential workers are still getting sick. Workers are risking their lives every single day, moving this economy so others can work from home. They deserve more than three paid sick days. Will the Conservative government commit today to treating workers with the dignity that they deserve by bringing in two Question. weeks of paid sick days? Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I want to begin by thanking uh, the member opposite for supporting our government's uh, legislation to pass uh, a comprehensive package that includes 23 days of paid sick leave in record time here in the legislature. Thank you to the NDP. Thank you to the uh, independent uh, Liberals for joining with our government to ensure that workers do not have to choose between their job and their health. I can assure the member opposite we're going to continue working every single Order. day to protect the health and safety of every single worker until we defeat COVID-19 once and for all. And the supplementary question. Thank you. Back to the uh, Premier. When you're in a crisis, you don't do the bare minimum. You pull out all the stops. You do everything possible to save lives. But from the beginning of this pandemic, we have seen a clear track, or, track record from the Conservative government. They are continually doing the least possible to help Ontarians. Half measures are continually being brought forward and not enough help is being given to communities that need it the most. Now, the Conservative government is warning that Ontarians should be prepared for at least two weeks of a stay-at-home order and closure. But while they've warned of longer lockdowns, the truth is the Conservative government had every opportunity to stop the third wave, just like they had every opportunity to get this crisis under control sooner. Both times, instead, they chose to stand by and do nothing. 
We need more paid sick days. We need more vaccines. Question. We need more support for hotspot communities. We're in a crisis and people in, are dying. When will the Conservative government start acting like it? <laughs> Minister of Health. Well, we have been taking action throughout this pandemic, and especially as far as Peel and Brampton are concerned, they are receiving uh, their fair share of vaccines. In fact, in the month of May alone, we will be allocating 432,960 doses to Peel Region, which will make Peel the public health unit with the second highest doses rate per capita in the province. So we, know we are sending uh, sufficient quantities to Peel and to Brampton, of course, specifically, uh, in terms of places where they can be received. There are over 150 pharmacies, seven of which will be running 24-7, four hospitals, hotspot pop-ups. Uh, we have the uh, 40 primary care sites in Peel Region, and we also have workplace clinics at Maple Leaf Foods, Maple Lodge Farms, Amazon. Now, we know that there are 25 postal Response. codes that have been designated as hotspots in Peel Region, and the uh, entire region is receiving sufficient quantities to make sure that anyone who wants to receive a vaccine in Peel will be able to receive them. The next question, the member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, this week I've been having many encouraging conversations uh, with my constituents in Willowdale, uh, and it has to do with Ontario's COVID vaccine campaign, which has clearly moved into the next gear as doses enter the province at almost double the previous rate. Uh, over the last few weeks, uh, Ontario has had an army of health care workers that have set records when it comes to needles and arms, Speaker. And we've soared past the goal of 40% of, of Ontario's adult population getting at least their first dose by the end of April. Very encouraging to hear, in fact, from the health minister that over 6.3 million doses have been administered, with uh, perhaps best of all, the last million doses being um, administered in nine days and the million doses before that in just eight days. Uh, that's really good news, Speaker, and very encouraging for the, my constituents in Willowdale. Um, so, Speaker, my question is for the Solicitor General. With so much forward momentum on the vaccine front, what can members expect moving forward with Ontario's vaccine campaign? The Solicitor General to respond. Well, thank you very much to the member from Willowdale. You know, th it, this is exciting times as we see the increase in, in doses coming from the federal government. Um, we know that Ontarians are very excited about the rollout of Ontario's vaccine campaign, and there is a lot to celebrate. As you said, after smashing through our goal of 40% of adults receiving at least their first dose at the end of April, we've set an ambitious goal for the end of May. 65% of adults receiving at least their first dose, and we are well on our way. Ontario is expected to surpass 50% of adults in the next 48 hours will have received their first dose. It's incredible. With, with an average daily average of 120,000 vaccines being delivered every single day, we can all be proud of the Order. tireless work of thousands of healthcare workers and many, many volunteers who are assisting in this rollout campaign. It's exciting news, it's great news, and we are well on our way to getting, seeing the end of COVID-19 in Ontario. Thank you. Supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I, and I share that sentiment of excitement, and so do the people of Willowdale and, and Toronto. After such a difficult year, this is the good news I think we've, been all, uh, we've all been waiting for. Uh, the City of Toronto, Speaker, where I represent, uh, nearly 1.3 million vaccine doses have been administered, and, and this represents approximately half of the population in our great city. And it's clear that with the vaccine supply ramping up in the province, the goals that we've set for the month of May are well within reach. Um, so, Speaker, given these developments in the vaccine rollout, I'm hoping the Solicitor General can update the House on, on what expansions to vaccine eligibility have been introduced this month and what will be introduced in the weeks ahead. Mr. Solicitor General. Thank you, and thank you for your enthusiasm on this very critically important stage. You know, uh, with the stability in vaccine supplies comes stability and our ability to expand the eligibility ranges. That's why we started off the month by expanding eligibility to all of those in 18 and above in the 114 hotspot neighbourhoods across 
13 different public health units, as well as a series of planned expansions based on age and at-risk. Starting today, for example, individuals with at-risk conditions such as dementia, diabetes, sickle cell disease, as well as the second phase of people who cannot work from home, including grocery store, restaurant and transportation workers, are eligible to book an appointment to receive COVID-19 vaccine. In addition, Due to the increased vaccine supply, Response. we are adding at-risk health care workers and dialysis patients to the list of those eligible to book. It's exciting news, and I hope that people take the advantage of when you book, book quickly, because we have the vaccine for you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much. My question is to the Premier. A nightmare. Ridiculous. Just an awful experience. It just looks like rank amateurs top to bottom. The government simply doesn't seem to know what it is doing. These are quotes, Speaker, from uh, business owners describing the Ontario Small Business Support Grant Program. Countless MPPs in this House have now shared stories of the significant problems their constituents have experienced with this program. The government needs to correct these issues. You need to expand eligibility. You should not be stalling on this any further, and you need to ensure that businesses that are closed through this third wave can receive additional support. Will the government commit to doing that today? To reply on behalf of the government, the member for Willowdale and Parliamentary Assistant the Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the member from Waterloo bringing up uh, the Small Business Support Grant Program, a grant program which has helped 109 businesses, over 109 uh, small businesses, receive uh, $1.5 billion. In fact, Speaker, over 75,000 businesses have received a second iteration of that grant program. That's, that's $1.1 billion. It's a total of $2.6 billion being paid out to these small businesses with an average wait time of 12 days to get cash in hand, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, of course, Order. there are a, a large volume of businesses that have applied to this good program, and that's why we have doubled up on the resources available to get through that backlog. But what's very curious is that the member stands in her place today and calls for further supports when she has voted against every single one of those support measures, including the double of the small business grant, Order. which has helped about 1,000 businesses in Waterloo Region help weather the storm that is COVID-19. So my question to the member is, hopefully, if the government does introduce new measures, that she will support these small businesses with more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Order. The supplementary question. I just heard the minister. I, are you going to do that? That's that's what we've been calling for since last April. Uh, speaker. <laughs> Come to the table. Uh, another quote, Speaker. I've, and this is a quote. I've never seen a program that just didn't have anyone there. There's no one you can write to, no one you can call. There's no other number to ask to be elevated to speak with someone else ever. This lack of meaningful support or information is an issue not only with the grant program, but with the highly affected sectors like tourism and the event venues. In Waterloo Region, Bingham's and the Princess Cinemas, all of us have examples. They have not been able to generate revenue for a year. Businesses are about to be closed for another two weeks. That's another two weeks businesses' owners will be on their own without help from this government. They are at the breaking point. You need to do something to Question. support businesses for our economic recovery. When are you going to fix the small business program? When are you going to put some additional funding on the table? When are you going to expand the eligibility? When Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, speaker, thank you. And to answer the question of when, well, from the very beginning of this pandemic, this government has been there with the opposition come to order, working with all levels of government. And what the NDP has in common with all those support measures that they now call for is that they have voted against every single one. Speaker, whether that was a PPE grant for the smallest of small order. businesses, whether that was a reduction, permanent reduction to small business property taxes of up to 30 percent, whether that was broadband infrastructure investment, elimination of the EHT, a tax on jobs for the smallest of small businesses, digital Main Street program to help businesses retool and sell their products Order. online. Of course this is a tough time for small businesses. That's why this government has been there for them. The question is, why hasn't the NDP? Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley East. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question through you to the minister responsible for anti-racism. Can the minister update and inform this member House— Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Can the minister update and inform this House about the alarming and un un unacceptable increase in anti-Asian racism 
and how these extreme forms of hate have impacted Asian Canadians in our province over the last year. To respond, the Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. The member opposite is absolutely right. There has been a disturbing increase. Uh, we all appreciate and understand that it is coming from misinformation and misinformed individuals who are targeting a particular group, suggesting that that is the uh, cause of the COVID-19 outbreaks. Uh, it's terribly unfortunate. We have been working uh, within the Anti-Racism Directorate and, frankly, uh, across government um, to educate inform and ultimately uh, go after and shut down these individuals who are misinformed and are hurting our communities in a way that uh, is truly, truly indefensible at this time. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the minister for the answer, uh, but the government has frankly uh, done little over the last year to combat systemic racism and stop hate. Last week, I asked the minister um, why the new anti-racism strategy, the updated strategy, did not mention even the word Asian once within the entire document. Instead of pledging action, the minister made reference to a grant, which a small portion of, it, uh, of that grant actually uh, benefited one organization that's combating anti-Asian uh, racism. Uh, speaker, we need this government to stand up to hate and to protect the rights of all Ontarians, including Asian Canadians. And Speaker, it starts with this government taking initiatives and creating a strategy to tackle anti-Asian anti racism. But Speaker, because of the Minister's continued lack of focus on one of the fastest growing forms Question. of hate in Canada, I plan to bring forward a change to the legislation, the Anti-Racism Act today, and I want to know if the Minister will support those changes to include anti-Asian racism within the Act. Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. Well, I look forward to uh, reviewing the private member's um, uh, bill. I, obviously, I have not had uh, any insight into what he is bringing forward, but I'm happy to review it. Um, but, you know, I think it's important that we talk about the actions that our government has taken. And, you know, you, you mention uh, grant programs like they're inconsequential, and I think that is very unfortunate because the um, the enthusiasm and the encouragement that we have received talking to organizations saying this will help us, this will help educate, this will help protect us, and ultimately it will help uh, inform all Ontario citizens. So again, I will remind the member, anti-racism and anti-hate grant, grant will provide $1.6 million in total funding, will be accessible to communities throughout Ontario and provide investments to community-based projects. The organizations Spons? and communities ask us for these, um, in, these uh, investments. We have done that, and they are very pleased, and I'm happy to be working with them on this. Thank you. The next question, member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. I, I continue to have uh, some frustrating conversations with my constituents uh, regarding our border control measures, Speaker, from the federal government. We know that the majority of cases today are, are variants of concern. These are dangerous, and you know it's, it's a pretty clear message from the Prime Minister that this just isn't a priority for him in, in tightening up our border controls. And this is problematic for the people of Willowdale and our province because we know that these variants originate from outside of Ontario. Uh, and so while our government continues to urge uh, our federal partners to request real action to secure our borders, uh, we're going to continue calling on them in a vocal way, Speaker. So, you know, it's not just international travelers that are the concern. Of course, there are people coming in from other provinces carrying the variants. And, and my question is for the Solicitor General. I'm hoping that she can share with the House uh, what is our request to the federal government when it comes to these domestic travelers question. to make sure that Ontarians can remain safe from these dangerous variants of concern. Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Speaker. You know, our, uh, our request to the federal government was really very simple. It was three. One, to actually shut down the land and water uh, international travel that is happening um, between our southern um, partners. Uh, it, was actually, it was to make sure that when domestic uh, visitors come in, they get tested immediately at the border. What we are finding, as we've highlighted previously, is when a domestic traveler comes into Ontario 
and goes back to their place of residence or where they're visiting, then books an appointment, then gets the test, then waits for the results of the test. How many people did they interact with? How many people did they put at risk? We're seeing the variance increase. There's a very simple fix that the federal Order. government could do, and that is test people when they arrive at the border. Response. The third and final thing, of course, is make sure that when individuals self-isolate, they do the proper follow-up and make sure that they're doing the right thing. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. You know, and I, I hope I don't sound too frustrated in the legislature today. It's just the frustration of my constituents are, are at, a, at a boiling point because it's been a tough year, and, and that's the case for, for people all over this province. And after making those sacrifices over a very difficult year, it's fair of Willowdalers to expect some sort of action from our federal cousins on getting these borders under control, protecting us from these dangerous variants of concerns. And, and I know the Liberals are, are heckling me and call this about xenophobia. It's absolutely not about race. This is about protecting Ontarians against these dangerous Order. variants of concerns and putting in safeguards, putting in safeguards at the federal level to make sure that we protect all Ontarians. So, Speaker, back to the Minister. Can she provide examples of, of the concerning trends uh, from incoming travellers at Toronto Pearson? Pearson being, of course, Canada's largest airport right here in the region of Peel. Solicitor General. Well, thank you, Speaker. Um, yes, unfortunately, it is a disturbing one and uh, a, a very direct one. So we know uh, that the P1 variant of COVID-19 has been connected to a massive outbreak in Brazil. And we know that travel remains a major vector for transmission. Just across the border from Hamilton, the Buffalo Airport has a full web page dedicated to transportation for Canadians. I don't need to remind members of how some travellers move across the border to avoid airport quarantine. Even though our government is taking extra precautions by closing our interprovincial land borders to help keep out the variants, we do not control our international borders. All levels of government must work together to keep our citizens safe, including those carrying variants of COVID-19 traveling into Ontario, which is why we will continue Fonts. to call on the federal government to help secure international entry points and further strengthen screening at our borders. Thank you. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Beaches East York is home to communities of essential workers who have no choice but to work precarious jobs with no benefits. They've watched neighbours evicted. No work, no home. They can't take that risk, so they go to work, sick or not. The Premier stayed home for 14 days to ensure he wouldn't get his family sick, but he's only willing to give three days to essential workers, and as a result, they and their families are ending up in the ICU. And as much as the government would like everyone to believe that the COVID fire raging in Ontario is entirely due to plain loads of foreigners, the science table and critical care doctors have been clear it is driven by workplaces. When is the government going to put in place a program of play, paid sick days that will allow workers to stay home when they are sick and Ontario to heal? Thank you. Mr. Labour, Training and Skills Development, to reply. Well, thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And again, I would thank the member opposite for her support uh, in our province's uh, paid sick leave plan. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we were the first province in the country to bring forward uh, paid sick leave for workers. It's a comprehensive plan of 23 days, so workers don't have to choose between uh, their job and their health. Mr. Speaker, the health and safety of every single worker. Uh, in this province, in their families, in their communities, is our government's top priority. We will continue to stand with workers every day until COVID-19 is defeated. Supplementary question. Speaker, what we have in Ontario is a perfect storm of bad policies. Last March, the Premier promised that nobody would lose their housing due to COVID, but that turned out to be a fairy tale. Thousands upon thousands of people who lost income due to COVID have been or are being evicted to couch surf or into homelessness because there's no moratorium on evictions for arrears and no rent relief. Essential workers in Beaches East York are terrified of losing their housing. Three days of paid sick days are simply not enough to allow people to stay home or to stem the tide of workplace infections. And ultimately, all of Ontario is suffering as a result. When is the Premier going to do the math and give people the paid sick days they need to stay home when they are sick so that we can end the devastating cycle of lockdowns and begin to rebuild our lives? 
Before I ask the Minister to respond, I'm going to caution the member on their, on their use of language and now ask for the reply from the Minister of Labour. Again, I thank uh, the member opposite and her NDP party for so supporting uh, our comprehensive package to support workers. 23 uh, paid sick days are available uh, to workers uh, in this province. Again, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue uh, to ensure that uh, every worker is protected so they don't have to choose between their job and their health, and we'll be with workers uh, every single day until we defeat COVID-19. Thank you. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Small businesses are hurting, barely hanging on if they haven't gone out of business already. The third wave has forced small businesses to close for a third time, and there is speculation that they will remain closed well into next month. Speaker, small businesses are doing their part to save lives, but they need the government to have their back. So I have a simple yes or no question. Will the Premier triple the Ontario Small Business Support Grant to help small businesses survive the third wave? To reply, the member for Willowdale. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I think I've mentioned in this House, I have, I have a great deal of respect from the member from Guelph. Uh, we've had uh, many conversations with the small businesses, not just in his riding, but throughout this province, through our work with the Finance Committee, listening to the very difficult times they're going through from the beginning of this pandemic. That's why this government has responded in step with our, our, level, our partners at other levels of government to provide a blanketed measure of support. And we've introduced a series of supports, not just the Small Business Support Grant program, but uh, with help with hydro, uh, with fixed costs like property taxes, reducing or eliminating eliminating, in, in many cases, uh, attacks on jobs, the EHT, for the smallest of small businesses, in fact, Speaker. But it's curious to hear that the member from Guelph is calling for a third round of the Small Business Support Grant program when he voted against the second round. So the question, yes or no, is if we introduce more support measures, will the member finally support and vote in favour of those supports? And the supplementary question. Speaker, I think small businesses wanted a yes response to my previous question. The bottom line is, is wave one and two supports, inciting those, will not get small businesses through wave three, especially when the current program is broken. I just want to quote one of many small businesses who reached out to me. I just got off the phone with the call center and I got to hurry up and wait, that they don't have any timelines on payments. Speaker, businesses simply cannot hurry up and wait. I can tell you as a longtime small business owner that cash flow is critically important. So I will support a third round of funding and a system that is fixed. So, Speaker, through you, I ask Question. the government, will you expand the eligibility criteria of the Small Business Support Grant, bring in a third round of funding, and fix the existing broken system? Again, the member for Willowdale to reply. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate the passion from the member from Guelph, and it's encouraging to hear uh, that he will consider uh, changing the voting record and, and supporting small businesses for, for supports uh, moving forward. And, and, and it's, it's, it's important to talk about the supports that the businesses in Guelph have received. I mean, in the first iteration of a grant program, they had received over $11 million. This helped uh, well over 700 businesses in the area of Guelph, uh, and now the member has voted against that. But in the second round, these businesses will be given more support. And of course, we are not through this storm that is COVID-19, and I will We'll work with that member and his constituents and small businesses to make sure that we are listening to them about where these targeted measures can best help these small businesses. Because what I have in common with that member is I too am from a background in small business. My family made a new life for themselves in this the best country in the world based on small business, and we need to help them. So I encourage that member to reach out to my office. Let's get the job done. Let's put COVID-19 in the rearview rear mirror and make Response. sure these small businesses are not just prosperous again, that they are the most successful that we have in the entire world. The next question. <laughs> the member for Willowdale. Thank 
you. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Solicitor General. Uh, since first learning of COVID-19 last year, I know that our government has been committed to taking all the necessary steps to ensure that our communities remain safe and healthy during these uh, unprecedented times. Uh, protecting Ontario includes taking swift action to support that, to, to secure, to make sure that our borders are secure from all travellers entering uh, our, our province that are carrying these dangerous variants of concern. Uh, now, Speaker, we heard some extremely concerning news recently that cases of the P1 variant have quadrupled, quadrupled from Thursday to Sunday in the Hamilton region. As we continue to manage this third wave of the virus in this province, Speaker, I'm hoping the Solicitor General can address the continued need for strict measures at our border now so that the P1 variant uh, doesn't uh, grow from what it has already become. Thank you. The Solicitor General. Uh, the member from Willowdale is absolutely right. Um, the, the case that you mentioned in Hamilton, they've seen the number of cases tied to the worrisome COVID-19 variant first identified in Brazil more than quadruple in the past week. As of Sunday, the P1 variant, considered more spreadable and possibly more dangerous to young people, has been confirmed in 14 Hamilton residents up from just three cases reported Thursday. This is how quickly variants can move through our community, Speaker. We've been testing for the P1 variant, and it wasn't there last month. Although we have identified P1 in Ontario, there are many more variants and mutations that have not yet been detected in Ontario. Our current cases are dominated by variants that come from other jurisdictions, and all of which were introduced into Ontario through travel. Once again, we ask Response. the federal government to take the action to keep these variants out, out of Ontario and our communities. Thank you. And these supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And, you know, we, we continue to hear, I think, in all of our writings, these concerning stories from constituents about what they feel are very weak uh, border measures to protect against these variants of concern. And, and I know I certainly heard my share uh, from uh, the great people of Willowdale, Speaker. And, you know, we, we need to make sure we work together here to tell our federal partners to say that this is a concern for all of us here in this province. Protect us against these dangerous variants. It's a simple request. So, Speaker, my question back to the Solicitor General, can she explain why we, we still need to have concerns about keeping travellers carrying COVID-19 out of Ontario, given that the variants are already here in our province? Ms. Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. So we know that these new variants did not originate in Ontario. They're coming here from other parts of the world and, indeed, other parts of Canada. We asked Ontarians to do their part, and they're following public health advice. Meanwhile, the federal government refuses to even test incoming passengers. The Premier of this province has repeatedly asked the federal government to step up and do their job. We need to ensure that our borders are secure. Do you know that the population larger than the entire city of Mississauga passed through Pearson Airport just since January? The majority were not even required to take a PCR test. Ontarians expect that most travellers should and will be tested. Will the members opposite join us in calling on the federal government to implement PCR testing for all travellers? It's time for the federal government to take this seriously. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Tenants at Rebecca Towers in Hamilton is asking for help. The, the high-rise building is home to seniors, essential workers, newcomers, and working-class families, and it now has over 100 confirmed cases of COVID-19. The outbreak in the building has been growing since March, and it is located in a community that has a test positivity rate of 22 per cent. Yet this area is still not a provincial hotspot. My question to the Premier is why were the tenants at Rebecca Towers left to get sick or die without the province acting to get this community more resources, more vaccines and urgent help? To reply, the government house leader. Uh, 
uh, look, I thank the honourable member uh, for the uh, for the question. Uh, she she knows uh, uh, much of the. Uh, uh, the, the plan for uh, this month, especially with the increase in, vac in vaccines that we've received from the federal government, has been to attack some of the hotspots across the province, hotspots that have been identified by both the science table and by the local public health, uh, by public health units. Uh, what she raises is obviously uh, uh, very, uh, very concerning, and, uh, and uh, I'm sure it's something that uh, uh, we will work with uh, public health uh, in, in Hamilton uh, to address shortly. Thank you. Supplementary question. I thank you, uh, Speaker. Not only are the tenants of Rebecca Towers facing a horrible COVID-19 outbreak, but they are also facing the consequences of this government's terrible housing policies. In the middle of this pandemic, the tenants are fighting an above-guideline rent increase, and the building has fallen into complete disrepair. With only one elevator in service and no regular cleaning of the common areas, it is no wonder COVID-19 is spreading so quickly. Rebecca Towers needs a safe building, and the whole community need their vaccines now. Why has the province allowed landlords to raise the rents and let buildings like Rebecca Towers fall into such a level of disrepair that it is making people sick and die during this pandemic. Government House Leader. Uh, thanks again. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Speaker. As you know, of course, uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, uh, when uh, there have been shutdowns and when uh, uh, previously we entered uh, grey zones, uh, of course, evictions were stopped across the province. We brought in uh, uh, rent freezes, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, uh, uh, it is very important when it comes to vaccine distribution uh, uh, that we hit hot spots, uh, Mr. Speaker. As you know, and as the member opposite will know, uh, the hot spots uh, are the focus of our vaccine distribution plan for uh, for this uh, this month. It is very important, Mr. Speaker, as the Minister of Health uh, has highlighted, uh, uh, that we get to these hot spots. We're identifying hot spots by working with local public health, but also working with the science uh, science table, uh, Mr. Speaker. But uh, I can assure the, the member opposite that uh, uh, we will certainly follow up with local public health officials in her areas. Uh, her constituents deserve uh, uh, access to the same uh, great vaccination distribution program that all Ontarians get. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. On May 3rd, CDTV ran an article about a Toronto woman who died from kidney cancer because her surgery was delayed three times. Cancer, heart procedures, hip replacement, knee surgeries, and cataract operations are cancelled daily by government directive. Yesterday, the FAO revealed that Ontario's backlog of surgeries will take more than three and a half years to clear. So many Ontarians will lose their lives. But the most astounding fact is that almost all beds saved by cancelling surgeries are sitting empty. Surgeries of real patients are being cancelled to save beds for computer-modeled COVID patients, and while the field hospitals are barely being used. Speaker, there are more than 6,000 employees at the Ministry of Health. Has anyone done the math on how many people will lose their life because surgery was cancelled versus how many lives will be saved as a result of the cancellation? And if they haven't done such a comparison, will the minister commit to the House to undertake a study and report to the House? The question is simple. What is the estimate of the number of people whose lives are saved from COVID by cancelling surgeries versus what is the estimate of the number of people that will lose their life as a result of their surgeries being cancelled? To reply, the Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, where to start? Uh, first, let me assure the member opposite that the beds in Ontario hospitals are unfortunately filled right now. They're filled with people with COVID. They're filled with people who are there for other reasons, people who have had surgeries, but they are filled. We are very concerned about the levels. They are starting to go down. The numbers in our intensive care units are starting to go down, but we're not in the clear yet. We still have a lot of work to do, and that is why we've had to postpone some of the surgeries and diagnostic procedures uh, during this third wave as we had to between the first and second waves but it is something that we are making sure that we can we're looking at the situation on a daily basis as it stands now over 88 percent of our hospitals have completed sorry most of our hospitals have completed 88 percent of their surgeries for the year and uh, they are we are Response. looking at ways that we can catch up to those surgeries when we come back out of it but I can assure the member opposite that the uh, the beds in our hospitals are full right now that's not computer modeling. They're full. Supplementary. I guess I invite the minister to make the CCCO public so the public can see how many beds are actually full. ICU capacity has never went above the 83-84% uh, the mark. So, Speaker, my question was reasonable. 
The minister always says that the goal is to save lives. So why does she have the, why doesn't she have the courage to study if she's actually costing more lives than she's saving? Clearly, she doesn't have the confidence to own her decision. But speaker, it gets worse because apparently the province is canceling all elective surgeries, and that includes surgeries of ambulatory patients who don't need a bed. Yesterday, the Globe and Mail read an opinion piece by Dr. Nam, a professor of surgery at U of T specializing in urological cancers. Nam is turning away patients due to the directive to cancel surgeries. He says for cancer surgeries, paid awaiting treatment, the hopes of being able to beat cancer were severely harmed by a stroke of a pen. He doesn't understand why the order applies to ambulatory patients who do not require a bed after a surgery. And this is true not just for Question. cancer. Many arthritis, gallbladder, hernia procedures don't require a bed. Speaker, what's the minister's excuse for cancelling outpatient surgeries? Will she please just own a order. mistake and rescind the order and restore cancellation of outpatient surgeries? Thank you. Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. Um, well, there's a lot there, but I'll, uh, I'll try to answer part of your question. One is that if people, we've already conducted over 420,000 procedures and surgeries since this pandemic began last year. So that if someone has cancer or they have a cardiac issue that is threatening their life, they will receive surgery. And I want the people of Ontario to know that. If you need to be in hospital, please go to the hospital. The uh, hospitals are safe, and if you need surgery for cardiac or cancer care, you will receive that surgery to save your life. This is something that is not done by politics. This is done by medical professionals who assess every case to determine whether that person needs to have surgery right away or whether it can be delayed for a point in time. I am confident that our medical experts are making the right decisions. I am Response. confident that we have a plan. It is very unfortunate that we have to delay some of these surgeries and procedures, but I can assure the member and I can assure the people of Ontario that we are looking at the numbers on a daily basis. And as soon as we can restart that procedure and surgical backlog, start to work on that, we will because we sure. know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. There's a housing crisis in Niagara. People from my community can't afford to buy a house. Families are torn apart. Kids forced to leave our community. They were raised in to find a home of their own. A recent report showed that Niagara experienced a 14% drop in housing affordability, the largest drop in Canada. Residents of Niagara are getting priced out of the market. People are, are evicted from their properties purchased by investors and they can't find an affordable rental unit. They end up on the streets. This is driven by greed and it has to end. The average home price in Niagara is nearly $750,000. Families in Niagara have not seen wage increases at the same level as housing costs increase. So my question, Mr. Speaker, what is the Premier going to do today to address this crisis and make it so people can afford to own a home in Niagara? Chairman House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Actually, I really appreciate the question from the Honourable Member uh, because it is something that this government has been focused on uh, from day one, Mr. Speaker. We have consistently talked about affordability on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. It is ironic to hear a question coming from the member opposite who has voted against every single measure to make this province more affordable for the people of the province of Ontario, including those first-time home buyers who are doing exactly what he's saying. They're saving. They're trying to put money away so that they can buy their first home, and it becomes very increasingly difficult when, if you listen to the opposition, governments are digging in your pocket and taking away all of that extra money that you should be putting away for your first home, Mr. Speaker. So, look, we are seized with this, Mr. Speaker. We know how important it is for people to be able to buy their first home, and that is something that this government has been focused on from day one. So I really invite the Honourable Gentleman opposite Response. to work with us to bring down costs for people, to make it more affordable to buy homes so that more people can enjoy the, the first home that he is talking about. Supplementary. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. I spoke with young people in my community that are saving whatever they can to buy their first home. Right now, the dream of being a homeowner is becoming just that, a dream. It's sadly reality for many hardworking first-time home buyers. Homes for sale are getting multiple offers and bidding warrants, selling well over asking prices, sometimes $100,000 over asking. What average working in Ontario can afford that? People renting are facing rental evictions in our community and at an alarming rate. Our wait list for affordable housing in Niagara is so long, 
The average wait is over a decade. Again, Mr. Speaker, the question is, will the Premier finally stand up to speculators? Investors only inter interested in padding their own pockets. Support the hardworking people of Niagara and question. the practice of greedy speculators driving up housing costs. Will, will he take action to make homes in Niagara affordable again for our kids and our grandkids, their kids and their grandkids? Thank you. Again, I, I certainly would expect that the member opposite would expect that this is a whole of government approach uh, to ensuring that there is availability. You have to ensure that there is avail availability and supply is there for people. You know, just earlier today, the, uh, the member for Kitchener talked about two-way all-day go trains uh, service that this government has brought uh, to uh, to his region, Mr. Speaker. That makes it more affordable and easier for people to work in different parts of the province. That's one important feature. The Minister of Infrastructure has brought in a groundbreaking over $4.5 billion dollar broadband uh, project which will see all of the province of Ontario connected to broadband making it essential because more people will be able to work from home and live in diverse parts of the province. We're hearing from across the province different members. I heard from the member for Tamiskaming talking about all the people that are moving to his community from the GTA. This is what we need to do, Response? Mr. Speaker. Open up more parts of the province so that people can have their first home. It's more affordable, Mr. Speaker, and this government is taking a whole of government approach to make sure that it happens. Next question, member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Mr. Speaker, it's been weeks since the federal government presented Canada's national child care plan. Ontario Liberals have committed to working with the federal government to implement $10 a day licensed child care, which will save Ontario families on average $10,000 a year per child. Now, this is money that families can use to save for post-secondary education, put away for retirement, or pay down uh, their personal debt. This is a lot of money, Mr. Speaker, especially in those early years of parenthood. One might think the Premier would react enthusiastically and get on board with the federal partners to deliver real relief for families. But, Mr. Speaker, that's hardly the case. We all remember that it was Conservatives who killed the last national child care plan, and it seems like the Premier's government is about to do it again. So, Mr. Speaker, why won't the Premier do the right thing, partner with the federal government, and provide $10 a day child care to all Ontario families? To reply, the Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I will uh, remind him that when his party was afforded with the honour of serving for 15 years, the cost of childcare rose to the most expensive and the second most expensive system in the nation. That is not a program or a metric by which any member of this legislature should Order. be proud of. What we are doing in this House in our first budget as a recognition that child care was inaccessible and unaffordable was we introduced the child care tax credit, a credit that is flexible, recognizing that moms and dads come to order. Will, raise their, will raise their children um, uh, in keeping with their values and recognizing the inherent cost of raising every child, irrespective if they use institutional daycare. What we have done is introduced a credit that provides up to 70 percent of eligible expenses supporting 300,000 families. In the most recent budget, Speaker, we topped it up. To answer the question, yes, we are going to work with uh, the federal government. I've spoken to Minister Ahmed Hussein myself on this matter as we work together to make child care more accessible. And Thank you very much. And the supplementary question. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, women are bearing the brunt of job losses during COVID-19. An analysis by RBC shows that working-age Canadian women are leaving the work workforce at a rate 10 times higher than men. The she session is real, and the government doesn't seem to have a plan to do anything about it. Increasing women's workforce participation has the potential to grow Ontario's economy by $7 billion a year. Our economy won't recover, though, Mr. Speaker, from COVID-19 without full and equal workforce participation, and that won't happen without childcare. And yet, Mr. Speaker, the government seems unwilling and uninterested to deliver affordable childcare to Ontario families. Now, Ontario Liberals have committed to delivering $10 a day licensed childcare and to ensure the economic dignity of childcare workers. There's an opportunity for transformation in childcare and throughout the economy, Mr. Speaker. So, through you, will the Premier join us in working with the federal government to deliver Ontario families $10 a day licensed childcare? To reply, the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as the Minister of Education just mentioned, uh, he is working very closely with the federal government, as I am, and uh, my colleague, uh, Minister Dunlop, is as well. Uh, we know that uh, 
and the government is certainly aware that COVID-19 has uh, disproportionately impacted on the economic and social well-being of women across the province and that they've been affected both at home and in the workplace and that's why we're working hard to ensure uh, that there is more childcare space available uh, for them to access and uh, we will be working with them uh, given the investments that we have made in childcare to ensure that we're working towards the goal that the federal government has set in their recent budget up on Parliament Hill. Uh, but Mr. Speaker, our government wants to build a province where every woman Response. and every girl is empowered to succeed because promoting women's full economic participation supports Ontario's continued growth and prosperity, and that is the goal of our government here in Ontario. Okay, the next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Deputy Premier. And uh, uh, earlier in the question period, in response to the leader of the official opposition, the uh, Deputy Premier uh, stated, I believe, that um, everyone in the province, when they got their first vaccine, would be, have an appointment set for the second vaccine. I would like to ask uh, the Deputy Premier to confirm that that is actually the case. Order. Minister of Health. Actually, uh, yes, to clarify, I did. It's warned. Minister of Health. The second dose, but I can advise that we have over four and a half million people booked for their first and second doses already, and uh, over a million of them were booked in the last week. So this is something that it depends, of course, where you make your appointment through, whether it's through the central booking number or through a pharmacy, uh, but through the central booking system that we have over four and a half million already booked for first and second doses. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I appreciate that, uh, that uh, clarification because that did not come through in the first response. Because, and for, 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 an ex Order. for an example, I, I got the vaccine through a pharmacy. I specifically, my wife and I, we specifically asked for a date for the second vaccine, and we were told you will just have to keep looking. And that is part of the issue with the vaccination program that there are many streams and people are, com are, are um, confused. And I'm glad that the minister um, clarified that, but I would ask, could please clarify more widely because people, people are clamoring for information and each time it's partly explained just adds, adds to their confusion and, and to their fear. Could you please do that, minister? Thank you. Minister Health. Thank you. Well, we are providing people with information as broadly as possible, and now people have choices about where they can receive their vaccines. They can be received through their primary care provider, and that's happening for a lot of people with pre-existing health conditions that want to understand whether it's safe for them with their health conditions to do that. Mass vaccination clinics, pharmacies, of course, so we're adding more pharmacies uh, by the week. We expect to reach 2,400 pharmacies offering vaccines by the end of May. We also have the pop-up and mobile vaccination clinics. We want to make it as easy as possible for people to receive a vaccine wherever they live in Ontario and whatever time of day, because we have many of our pharmacies also offering vaccinations 24-7. We're going to continue to work on that so that everyone who wants to receive a vaccine, first and second dose, will be able to do so. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. This house stands in recess until 3 p.m.